you got to realize that we grow up, we, we live our lives being told that we need to fit in. We need to conform. We need to listen. We shouldn't make too many mistakes. We should try and get high grades. And we keep being told these things by other people. And as good as these things are, you need to realize that there's two sides to every story. Just like you, have, you can't have love without hate, you can't have light without darkness, you can't have good without evil. There's two sides to every story. And we tend to live either in the middle or on one side. We tend to be average and stand for nothing, or we stand very strongly for left or for right. But the magic is found when you actually move away from the center and, and operate in both ends, in the contrast, in the black and in the white. You love and you hate at the same time. That's where the magic is found. So the flip side of the coin is that you need to be different in order to stand out. You need to stop listening to everything and acting upon everything everyone else says and start to find within yourself what you want to do, the decisions you want to make. You need to be courageous enough to stand up for the things you believe in because that's actually ultimately what differentiates you from everyone else and what gets others to pick you. So there's two sides to every, every story. And this thing different, this, when, when Steve Jobs came back to Apple in July 1997, Apple was three months away from bankruptcy. They had a whole range of products. And actually the first campaign they wanted to launch is We're Back. And Steve Jobs thought that's absurd. We never left, we've always been here. And even this campaign, Think Different, this was actually generated by TBWA Chiate, a competitor of ours as media brands. It's an agency. And the first time Steve Jobs heard this, Think Different, you know, the crazy ones, most of you would have been still in like kindergarten or primary school, it's 20 years ago, primary school maybe, kindergarten probably. But he loved it, he thought it was brilliant, but he also hated it. He wasn't in the center, he stood up for what he believed in. He gave his opinion, this is incredible what you guys have created, but he also gave his opinion, I hate it and we need to change it. And that was the beauty. That's where all of the magic happens when you ha start to operate on both ends of the spectrum. Move away from the middle. One thing you can remember if to be average, just do average things. To be remarkable, operate on the extremes of the spectrum. But not yeah. all. Can I interrupt? Yep. Uh, yeah, for sure. Is it necessary for you to um, uh, be on both sides of the spectrum alone or you can build a team for you to be on the left side and someone else, your partner, be on the right side? It's important that you, within yourself, operate on both of these sides. But if you want to form a business, then you need to empower others to also think that way. You need to spread what you believe in and, and get others to also believe it. So then you, it's the difference between a, an entrepreneur and a business. And I'll talk about that a little bit as well. So this campaign was about thinking different. It was about the crazy ones. The ones that pushed the human race forward. We made movies about them, we wrote books about them, they inspired us, we even let them lead us. But don't be fooled, these crazy ones, they're all around us, maybe even in this room. You know, as we move from a world of products to services, we're gonna need you to think different. As we move from a world of ownership to access, we're gonna need you to think different. And as we move from a world of scarcity into a world of abundance, we're going to need you to think different. There are people in this world that see problems and they'll complain. They'll complain forever. And there are people in this world that see problems and all they see is opportunity, an opportunity to solve, an opportunity to build a better world. You know, happiness in life, something we all seek, is actually found through solving problems. But where it gets really interesting is when we get to choose the problems that we want to solve. Then we feel empowered and then we have purpose. I just said moving from a world of products to services. Can anyone give me an example what, of what that would look like? Be known as ownership and accessible? 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you mean car when carrying a car? Very good. So Uber. Instead of owning a car, you access mobility. Another example, who here uses Spotify? Just about everybody. This is a perfect example of not actually owning the music. You don't go into a store and you buy a CD. No, you, uh, you, you buy the rights to access music. And now for the price of what you used to pay for a CD, you now have access to 22 million songs, every song ever made. Can anyone give me an example of scarcity to abundance? Because that's what technology does. Technology is a tool that turns scarcity into abundance. Can anyone think of an example? They're all around us if you care to look. Think of solar power. You know there's enough sun that hits the Earth's surface to power our energy needs for a whole year in one hour. The problem isn't energy. The problem is access to energy. And solar panels are, is a technology that allows you to extract the, the power from the sun and turn what used to be a scarce resource into an abundant resource. So water, the Earth is covered, three quarters of the surface of the Earth is covered in water. There's plenty of water, it's just that it's not accessible yet. Technology will solve that. It'll make that water accessible and drinkable. So as everyone's getting into the dirts, which is what we tend to do, we tend to focus on the what and the tactics. We get our hands dirty, we get into the data, we do all these things that, that are just really aimed at trying to figure out how to solve problems today. We're gonna to go in the other direction in the next 20, 30 minutes. We're gonna go up into the clouds and we're gonna listen. We're gonna listen for tomorrow because as David Bowie once said, the future belongs to those who hear it coming. He was quite the visionary. In the 1990s, he had the first, one of the first ISPs. He said in the mid-90s that artists, singers, songwriters would be born and bred on this thing called the internet. And the first question that came back was, what is, this? what is the internet? Most people weren't even emailing back then. And he already saw it coming. He knew this. And, and even with his last song, he sung it from his grave. He was dead when that song actually came to the public. Who knows who this is? Elon Musk. Probably the most celebrated entrepreneur today. Did you know he was bankrupt in 2008? And a short five years later, he was worth 10 billion? This is a person that thinks differently about things. You know, so while Elon Musk is redefining mobility with Tesla, the boring company, Hyperloop, SpaceX, and redefining energy with solar cities, gigafactories, and even re redefining what it means to be human with Neuralink, trying to connect our brains to the internet, make us smarter. The best minds of our generation are trying to figure out how to get people to click more ads. Can anyone tell them where these minds live? Who do they work for? Silicon Valley? A lot of them are in Silicon Valley, but a lot of them are also in other places such as China. What are some companies that, two companies, two companies where these brilliant minds can be found? Google, another one, Facebook. This is actually a quote from someone that came from Facebook. And <coughs> Facebook and Google control now over 90% of all the digital advertising spend. Because of this, they figured out a way on how to get people to click more ads. But you see, there's a problem, because in a mobile environment, the only ads people want to see are the ads they would miss if they were not there. This quote comes from Seth Godin. Who's heard of Seth Godin? No, nobody. So in, if you're going to take on a role, yeah, one, one person? Yeah. yeah, Seth Godin, Seth Godin. Two, who else? <coughs> so he's the sort of oracle of direct marketing. In the early 90s, he was saying all the things that we're talking about today. And he's written 19 books. One of those books is called The Purple Cow. And it's a book I recommend you all read because it's a book about how to market yourself or your product or your invention in a noisy environment. How to become remarkable, how to stand out, how to be different. <coughs> it's a book you can get for free. <coughs> if you go to audible.com, it's an Amazon company. 
The first book is free. If you don't yet have an Audible account, you can sign up for one. The first book is free. Just get use your credit on The Purple Cow. It takes about three hours to listen to. And it could be a book that changes the way you think about digital marketing, about marketing in general. Who here has watched Mad Men? Who here has heard of Mad Men? A few, okay, quite a few have heard of Mad Men, half of the room. No one's watched it? Okay, if you want to get into marketing, especially digital marketing, and, and want to pitch your ideas and, and get things done, I suggest you go and watch Mad Men. At least the first couple of seasons. See, this is Don Draper, and he's the lead character in Mad Men. And you'll get to love him, because he's really someone that thinks differently, stands up for what he believes in. And they're blocking our ads. So you see now, people block ads because they can. But in the 50s and 60s, it was unheard of that people blocked your ad. It was just unheard of. What you've got to understand is that television, radio, outdoor advertising, print, these were all mediums created, invented <laughs> by advertisers and marketers to focus attention, bring people in for the content, and deliver a message. You see, they had control. And, and the, the consumer wasn't empowered at all. They had no control. If they wanted to consume that content, then they would be subjected to a 30-second or one-page commercial. You had time and you had space. But in today's era, the biggest mass-made communication medium we have, the internet, wasn't invented by advertisers and marketers. It was invented by a bunch of nerds. It started in the US. It was more of a military application then became an educational application, and then we made a commercial in the 90s. What does the internet do? It connects people. It connects things. The internet is a connection machine. Very good. But it also takes away the concept of time and the concept of space, distance. I can now connect with someone on the other side of the world at a millisecond. It takes away the concept of time and I don't need to travel there. It takes away the concept of distance. It brings us together. So you see, we've come all this way to have someone stand up this year. This is the COO of Adblocker Plus, and the ERB is the Interactive Advertising Bureau. And this is what he started with. We screwed up. We lost track of user experience, which is really what it comes down to. You see, marketers tend to ruin everything. Marketers tend to exploit once for profits and they'll get in there and they'll make money and they'll deliver their ads and they'll deliver their messages until everyone gets annoyed and they leave. Why do you think Facebook purchased WhatsApp? Why do you think they tried to why do you think they purchased Instagram? Why do you think they're bidding highly on Snapchat? Because that's where the attention is going. That's where the use is going because people are starting to get annoyed with Facebook. It's becoming too noisy, it's becoming too connected. You don't even know what if anything's on there is true or false anymore. Sometimes you need your own little space to have your conversations and build your relationships. Facebook understands that. Facebook understands that it's attention. It's the, we're going into an attention economy. And where the attention goes, that's where these companies delve into. That's what they try to bring into their ecosystem. Google understands this also, also well. And you see, if you keep delivering ads to people that are irrelevant, that they don't want to see, then this happens. Ad blockers start to get installed. And the red line is desktop, and the green line is mobile. Look at the slopes of these lines. This was beginning of this year. Over 600 million ad blockers are installed. That's about a third of the internet population. And look at the slopes. It's not about to stop. And you know what's happening? Is that Google, with their next Chrome update, it's going to build in an ad blocker, their own ad blocker by default. They want their own users to start blocking their own ads, what's actually generating 95% of their revenues. Pretty remarkable, right? What, what's, what, what's about that? That's about being completely different, thinking completely against the grain. In order to be disruptive, it's better to disrupt yourself instead of someone else doing it for you. They're actually ahead of the curve. They try to take out what keeps them in business disrupt themselves and see how they can survive. So they're actually empowering the user because, you see, at the end of the day, they know the user is going to get an ad blocker from somewhere. It may as well come from Google. They know that. So they build it by default. And Apple, what are they doing? 
The next iOS update, Safari is going to block not just ads, but everything. The user's going to be empowered. It's just going to be one little swipe to the right, and you're going to block trackers, you're going to block pixels, you're going to block ads. And what are digital marketers going to do then? How are they going to track people online in order to deliver meaningful advertising? It requires a new breed of digital marketer, someone that really understands the core of human behavior and what it means to be human and what needs and wants mean in our society. See, users increasingly opt out of stuff they don't want. So the simple reason that they can. They're empowered now with technology because technology turns scarcity into abundance. So you see, it all comes down to this. Change is hard. People have a hard time changing. We're changing every day. We change all the time. But when we have to change for something we don't want to change for, it becomes really hard. So we need to understand why we're changing. Why do I need to change and evolve and adapt? You're doing it all the time. That's why you're here. You're trying to change yourself. You're trying to acquire knowledge that's going to help you at some point in the future. And you see what you need? The tractor driver is you. That's the marketer. That's someone trying to influence their board to implement an idea. It's the agency trying to influence a client in order to get them moving forward, to get them changing in a positive direction. The tractor, the tractor itself, that's the agency group. That's all of the knowledge that you have. It's the technology that you have. The trees, the client, and the soil is a sector they're in. And as agency workers, we're trying to pull our clients out of drying soil, out of infertile soil, soil we know is losing its nutrients, and we're trying to put them into more fertile soil, where the consumer is, on mobile, for example. Because if they don't shift and they don't follow the consumer and follow the attention of the consumer so that they can deliver their stories, then they're ultimately going to become irrelevant. And it comes down to this. It's black and white. It's do or die. The black is the old. The white is the new. And as an agency, we have to get our clients from the black into the white. If they stay in the white, they've got a chance of survival. If they stay too long in the black, they go out of business. But in order to adopt the new, you sometimes need to let go of the old. Just like in fitness. Who here does a bit of fitness? Who here is trying to lose weight or doing some dieting or has done it in the past? It's hard to change habits. Habits are what really define our behavior. From breathing to eating to sleeping to love to hate to everything we do. In order to build in new, better habits to help you achieve whatever goal you've defined for yourself, you sometimes need to let go of the old ones because they don't live together, they clash. You can't be healthy and unhealthy at the same time. Well, you can, but it's not sustainable, and ultimately one will win over. You'll either fall back into your old habits or you'll change forever and, and move on. So right now, companies, just like Facebook's and the Google's companies, in order to stay relevant in today's consumer environment. You know, we've all got them in our pockets. We spend most of our time on them. They need to be here. They need to be here because this is where the attention is. And this is where you tell your stories now. But you can't tell it in an interruptive environment. You can't serve an ad and interrupt someone, steal their time, and hope for the best. You need to be relevant. You need to help people to get to the next step. So I've got IA in there. We all know what AI is, artificial intelligence. Anyone can guess what IA is? bit of an abstract concept, but it stands for intelligent assistant. You see, that's the world we're moving into with AI and machine learning, is that we're going to get more and more of these assistants and bots that are going to help us interact with this digital ecosystem. Asking a question. You see, Google's always been a bot from the beginning. That, that little button on Google, I'm feeling lucky, that's an audacious statement saying, one day we're going to get it right. One day we're going to have the right, question, the right answer for you. And up until now, Google has made the most mistakes than any other company in the world. They just can't get it right. They serve up these hundreds of results. They take a guess. But they're learning. But they're learning because well, every time we interact with them, we give them data, whereby this AI called Google is learning, slowly learning the relationships that they have with us on an individual level, and slowly learning what relationships we have with other brands, <coughs> with other devices, with other people. 
slowly they're gathering that data through the digital ecosystem. They're starting to understand us. They're under, starting to understand the relationship that we're in with them. See, it all comes down to this, building relationships through technology. We are now trying to build relationships through technology <coughs> at scale. Because this thing called the internet, it's a connection machine. It connects us up with information, with products, with devices, with people, with brands. And in those relationships, in those connections, <coughs> is where data is being generated. Because when you connect through technology, <coughs> you generate data. I'm looking at you right now. There's a lot of input output going on right now. A huge amount from sound to temperature to <coughs> faces. There's no limit as to the input output I'm actually <coughs> able to process right now, yet I'm doing it seamlessly. A computer has a lot of trouble processing all of this data, but it's data in the end, it's information. And when you do it through technology, then you understand the relationship by looking into the data, because <coughs> in the data you can find if there's love, if there's hate, if there's trust, if there's belonging, are people annoyed, are people doing the things that you need them to do. So in the data you find your answers. And that's why data is becoming so valuable. That's why data is becoming the new oil. You know, the oil economy is seven trillion and decreasing, and the data economy is eight trillion now and increasing at a much faster rate than even the oil economy is decreasing. Data is becoming the new oil. Some say the new soil because data in its raw form means nothing. And AI and machine learning helps us extract value from that data and make it actionable. So this is what's happening. An invisible <coughs> revolution is coming. It's helping our mobility. It's helping us live our lives. It's helping the mobility of human experience. We're seeing it. It starts with a, a harmless mobile phone in your pocket. And then all of a sudden you've got a jawbone or some sort of <coughs> fitness wearable or smartwatch around your wrist. And then you've got a nest to control your temperature in your home. And then you buy a smart TV where you can connect all these apps and you've got internet seamlessly integrated. We don't have to connect to it anymore. That's why the internet is slowly disappearing. We don't have to connect to it anymore. It's always there now, like electricity, like water. And then we get a smart car and that's connected to it. And our mobile phones is at the center. It's the remote control of all these digital portals. And what this is, this is all brands slowly creeping into our, to our lives and helping us live our lives and building relationships with us. <coughs> and every time we interact with them, we generate data. And that data they use to understand us better so that they can build better products and deliver more meaningful advertising. That's what it comes down to. And this trend is increasing. We call it the Internet of Things. It's just a lot of things connected to the Internet. On the one side, there's innovation. That's companies actually building innovative products that we use that help us live our lives, help us save time, help us have more value, empower us to do the things that we need to do. But on the other side is adaptation. A lot of companies need to adapt to this new consuming, this new consumer behavior, this shifting consumer, in order to stay relevant. And, and the, the disconnect is that technology grows exponentially, and we're very linear as human beings. Who's heard of Moore's Law? Moore's Law, it's what basically put a, a supercomputer in our pocket. It's the, the processing power <coughs> doubles every couple of years. So the amount of chips, the processing chips you can fit on a circuit doubles in the amount of years. And, and this doubling is exponential. The, what we have in our pocket now, so we have more access to information in our pocket than, than the, the President of the United States 20 years ago. But basically what it comes down to is this exponential growth is what's causing our pain. Not, not necessarily as a consumer, but you could also consider as a consumer. You're being pinged and bombarded from every which direction through technology. And it's starting with your mobile phone. But as businesses, you know, in order to keep adapting to this digitalizing ecosystem, this digital era we call it, the fourth industrial revolution, this cognitive era, well, they have to adapt. They have to adapt new processes. They have to put new skills into people. They have to have new organizational structures that connect all of the, all the silos and help mobilize information so it empowers people to do their best work and it empowers companies to understand their consumers so they can build better products. Right now we're here. We're at about 25 to 30 billion connected devices and about 3 billion people connected to, to this thing called the internet. In the next three years it will double because it's exponential. 
So we're going to have five to six billion people connected by the year 2020, 2021. And you can be sure of that because it's Microsoft, it's Amazon, it's Google, <coughs> it's Facebook, it's Elon Musk connecting these people up. Whether it be a hot air balloon, whether it be satellites, whether it be drones, they'll get connected. That's something you can be sure of. And the amount of devices that are in our lives and are connected to this internet will also double. And that's just brands stepping in, trying to build relationships through technology, trying to understand human behavior. It's just the beginning. We're still in the plumbing phase. These things are all being connected up. They don't really work all that well sometimes, but slowly but surely we start adopting them in our lives. And that's how this thing is growing. So we're actually seeing the capabilities now. And when Spotify starts to work, then you start to pay Spotify and you want in on the relationship. You'll pay them 10 bucks a month. When Amazon starts to work, you want them in. You give them more data because they'll recommend things to you through their recommendation engines. You know, when Google Maps starts to work, you adopt it into your life and you have the app on your phone and you make sure it's on your dashboard in your car. And Google's very busy building Android systems into cars now. They've got relationships with car manufacturers and Apple as well. So they're all trying to get you to consume through them through digital channels so that the data that they generate helps them understand the relationship they're in with you. Is there still room for us to um, be innovative or are we just only uh, going to adapt <coughs> from this uh, oligopoly uh, oli company? What do you think? I think we just we have to adapt because they make the innovation. As you say, um, uh, Apple is going to make the changes, Google is go are going to make the changes in the, in the website. Um, we cannot do anything about it. We are not as big and as large and capable of making such changes, even if we want to dis uh, disrupt. So what if I told you that most of the people that you're talking about aren't as smart as you are? Okay, but they have the, uh, in the uh, how do you say, the abilities, the uh, are capable, the finance, the support. How do you think they got hold of those? Okay, it's a road. How do you think they got hold of these capabilities, of this knowledge, of all this stuff? How do you think, how do you think it happened in the first place? Who, who was responsible for it? Th themselves, they started. Themselves. So don't, this is where Steve Jobs come from. Don't think that the world around you, that it's built around you and you have no control over it. You actually have full control over defining what is around you. Mm -hmm. It starts with you. You can change things. You know, uh, Steve Jobs says, making a dent in the universe. You have the power to make a decision, to make a choice, to change the things around you. And that's how these companies start. They, they see a problem and they see an opportunity to solve. And they start to build the solution. And ultimately, if, if it's the right solution and people adopt it, then they start to have impact. Then they start to be disruptive. Then they start to take market share away from people, from companies and people still in that black, still in the old. And that's what moves them forward. And that's what makes a difference. So don't think for a second that you can't change it. Because that's actually <coughs> the biggest hurdle. It's this mindset of thinking everything's the way it is and I've got no influence over it. That's the biggest hurdle to overcome. When you start to overcome that hurdle, then you start to realize, geez, it's all for the picking. A conversational commerce is coming. I've talked about virtual assistants. They're going to come more and more. These are things that are still pretty dumb. <coughs> they're six-month-old babies, but they're learning. They're learning based on our behavior, based on the data we're giving them. And companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon are training these assistants to become smarter and smarter. And um, voice search is going to be 50% by the year 2020. Who here does a voice search from on a regular basis? Probably not many of you, right? Yeah, one or two. Because you see, changing behavior is very tough. We grew up on a more um, typing environment. But my daughter, who's five, she doesn't know how to write. She doesn't know how to spell. She doesn't know how to construct a sentence. But she sure knows how to speak. And when you know, she grabs my phone and I say, hey, have a go at Pokemon Go or go and play uh, Angry Rabbits or, or pop some balloons, she goes, no, 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 Papa. Uh, it will Google. And then she starts to speak to it. She knows where that microphone is. And she starts to speak to it and she goes, Wie ist das derechte Pokémon? And Google gives her the answer, and she starts to interact with the pictures and the videos. <coughs> but she's only doing voice search. So there's no behavior to change. She's starting already with voice search. It's going to be hard for her to go back to typing later. So it takes generations to change this behavior. And these assistants, 
There's Siri from Apple, there's Cortana from Microsoft, there's Alexa from Amazon. <coughs> this is like who's watched Lord of the Rings, you know? And there's this one ring to rule them all. That's what Alexa's building. Alexa is an assistant that actually connects all of the dots, understands you, builds a relationship with you, and your relationship with, with, is with Alexa. Google, they've called their assistant the Google Assistant. They've done that for a very specific reason, is that we don't need more relationships in our lives. We have enough relationships that it is. Actually, we're, so, we're hyper-connected. We've got too many relationships. There's this number called the Dunbar number. It's 150 meaningful relationships. Above that, they become non-meaningful. What are you doing when you're on Facebook, when you're on Instagram, when you're chatting, when you're on WhatsApp? You know, you're, you're trying to maintain all of these relationships and at, at some point it becomes too much because you're empowered now. You can have a thousand relationships, but then you do quantity over quality and your more meaningful relationships, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your parents, your sister, your brother, that sort of diminishes. You put less time into those because your time is your most valuable asset and that's been taken up in chatting with all these hundreds of people. And Google understands that. They know that you don't need another assistant in your life. It's a Google assistant. Your relationships with Google, and that's who you trust, and that's who you respect. And the Google assistant, the only way she can or he can help you is if you're in on the relationship, if you give it everything it needs in order to help you. So let's have a look at what Google's building. This is the Google assistant. Who's seen this video? So Google, this is the next generation of Google. They're building a Google for every person on this planet. When we started, we made this for everyone. So that everyone could find anything they need among the millions of bazillions of things in the world. Today, it seems like sometimes it's easy to feel like you need a little help with the stuff just in your own world. Your photos, phone, videos, calendars, messages, friends, trips, reservations, and so on and so on. Wouldn't it be nice if you had some help with all that? Wouldn't it be nice if you had a Google for your world? That's why we're building the Google Assistant. Hi, Amy. How can I help? You just ask it what you need. OK, Google, what do I have to do today? And your assistant understands and helps you out. You can even carry on a conversation with it. How long will it take to get to downtown Chicago from home? Here you go. What restaurants are there? Book a table at Cortino Restaurant. Sure. And the assistant is always there for you. So if you're on the road, you can ask it where to fill up. And if you're at home, you can ask it to play some music. Or if you're in a chat with a friend, it can show you what's playing tonight. It's like your own personal Google. Naturally, anything you share with it is safe and secure. And the more you use your Google Assistant, the more useful it becomes. Remember my bike combo is 326. Got it. And soon, you'll be able to access it from all sorts of places. So it will be everywhere you are. We made this for everyone. And today, we're making this just for you. Hi, how can I help? Meet your Google Assistant. So you see, the more you give it, the more it understands you. Just like in a real relationship, the more you share with your partner, the more they understand you and, and the more the relationship grows. And um, this is happening now. So what's happening is that these assistants, they're gonna be, they're gonna infiltrate all of our products from our smart cars to our TVs to our smartphones, that's where it's starting. It requires you to adapt to them and to start using them. Uh, that's a change, that, that's slow, we're hard, we resist change until it starts to work. You know, until you're in the car and you start to ask, you know, oh, where's my next appointment? And, and the assistant actually just does everything for you. It finds in your calendar where the next appointment is, it puts it into the navigation system and it tells you you'll be there in 12 minutes. It even tells you if there's a fever and you have to go around it. You know, that's what I mean. We're in the plumbing phase. It doesn't work all that well yet, but slowly but surely these things are being, are getting better. Uh, on the other hand, it's also uh, convenient for the user. On the other hand, for Google, I think it's a way to gather more big data on a personal, uh, how do you call that, on a more personal way of gathering big data. And do you think they will use that data so a good question um you know it's this is a huge topic so of course they're doing all this in order to generate data you know of course a lot of these innovation all these apps you're using pokemon go you know they resell location data 
you know, you need to log in now via your Google account to use Pokemon Go because Google wants that connection to see where you are so that they connect it to advertising. So it's, it's all a data play. A lot of these innovations are a data play, but who's heard of GDPR that's coming next year in Europe? Yeah, that's regulation. That's about getting consent from the user about what you're going to do with their data. So you're not allowed to, you know, get a piece of data from a user and then just give it to another company for a different purpose. You have to now ask the user, are you okay with this? So that's going to be a big challenge for companies, especially startups who are innovating and building technology to, to bring convenience into people's lives. So one thing you understand is that when things are free, you're the product. When things are free, you're actually exchanging personal data in exchange for the use of some cool tools that help you get things done. Who knows how it's going to play out? Will there be more, you know, will consumers be empowered by actually be able to monetize their data? Say, yeah, you can use this for a cost. Will they get complete control over their data and, and, and say whether they are, um, you're in, you're out with my data? Apple, I trust you, you can use this data, but Google, please don't, or vice versa. So it's, this is the big topic that you guys are going to be facing in the next three to five years. It's one of the biggest agenda points, and it's going to, huge, it's going to raise huge issues. And that's why so I built this model. This is a model I built early next, last year. It's, um, I built this in my sleep, by the way. I woke up at 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning, and I had this written out in 40 minutes. It, I've been in the industry for 20 years, and it's just something that came out of a dream, weird enough. It's when we sort of think up our best ideas. Who's noticed that the best ideas come up sometimes in the morning when you're just waking up, you, you've just had this, this, this cl you're, you're clairvoyant, you go into the shower and you've got this brilliant idea and then you, you start to drink your coffee and have your breakfast and you go, oh, what was it again? And it's all gone. You know, these are moments, these are, there, there's science behind this. So you need to take advantage of these moments. So I just woke up and I said, I'm, on a mobile phone, I just wrote out these nine words. So really, it, it, it was trying to answer a question where I used to ask um, some people in my team, you know, why would a company go online? Why would a company build a website? Why would a hairdresser build a website? Yeah, I could put a sign out the door. They could uh, launch a TV ad. They could... Uh, do a whole heap of things to get more conversions, cut better hair, have lower prices. They could, there's a whole heap of, you build a website in order to build more relationships. You build a website in order to reach more people, connect with more people. Now you can connect to seven billion people. You're not just relying on the people that walk by or the people that refer you to others. You, you now have the ability to build relationships at scale and pull people into your hairdresser and cut more hair. And, and so this is why I, I built this. On the one side, so to summarize the, the, the web in one sentence, the World Wide Web are linked devices that generate data. That's basically one sentence that summarizes everything. You know, why IoT? Because there's lots of devices. Why big data? Because there's just a lot of data and we can do a lot with it now if we're smart enough. You know, and where, um, where Google really came on and changed the game, they really changed the game, is that what they did was they collected the world's information and made it universally accessible and useful to everybody. They just took the world's information and put up a search bar and put all that information behind it. And they asked you just to come there and ask you questions. You could ask them questions. That's what Google is. It's a question and answer machine. You come in, you ask a question, and they hope to deliver the right answer for you. A personal answer, something that's relevant only to you. Because the more they understand you, the more they know the context that you're in and when you're Googling something like, you know, Tiger, they know you mean Tiger Woods because you're a golfing, passionate person and, and they lead you down the right direction. And um, so they personalize it. That's the first step, personalization. That's where direct marketing, that's where digital marketing, because with data, you can understand people and you can start to personalize things. The next step is actually building experiences. So think of Google Maps. It's Google that gets you there. You've got a relationship with Google. You operate the relationship is within the context of that experience. You trust them, you respect them, that they're going to get you to your destination in time, safely, and, and effortlessly. Convenience. You don't have to reach for a book. You don't have to take your eyes off the road anymore. They'll even speak to you while you're driving. So it's a relationship. It's an experience. They empower you. One thing you've got to realize is most of these apps that we have are just time management apps. They help you get more things done in less time for cheaper. A lot of them are free. 
They save you time, your most valuable asset. Something we just, it's all limited to every single one of us. You never get it back. You'll never get this hour back, sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> empowerment. They drive great value in our lives and ultimately for them to be sustainable is they need to help us live happier lives. Happiness is a very complex topic. It's control, it's purpose, it's connection, it's progress. Those are the four pillars of happiness, but it's also the ability to choose the problems that you wanna solve empowering you to solve your own problems. And that's what a lot of these apps do. They empower you to solve a problem that you have. You choose it, you go to the app store, you download that app and you choose to use that app. Have you noticed what the iPhone is? When you look at the iPhone, you look at that blank, you look at that black screen, it's a reflection of yourself. It's your own space. It's a behavioral space. That's why it was so successful. It was highly personal. It's you that builds this thing. No one else, you choose what apps come on your home screen. It's a behavioral space. It's a reflection of you. It empowers you to be who you want to be, who you aspire to be. It empowers you to connect to people, to connect to information, to get more things done. So Amazon, so that's how they build relationships with us. These technology, these companies from Airbnb to Uber, who are just platforms that, gen that help us get from A to B or sleep at night <laughs> under, under some shelter. You know, and, and they're platforms that collect data, understand who we are. They're highly personal platforms. They're very conversational. You converse with the other person on the other side. Their experiences, what, what's Uber? You click a button, a car pulls up, you step in, you have a pleasant conversation and you walk out. That's Uber. They've relieved all of the friction and they've done that by really understanding who you are, where you are, where you wanna go. You know, what are your patterns? You know, what's your behavior? What's your past behavior? Can we help you in the future? They, they even assume things before you even know it. They're an experience. They empower you to get from A to B. They drive value. And ultimately, if they make you happier, then you use them more and you recommend them to friends and you evangelize the brand. And that's how they grow sustainably. From Tesla, from TomTom, Tom, Spotify down here, but Facebook. So what happens is that, you know, Facebook, it's highly personal. Hey, they don't have a website, it's you, it's your profile, you build it. It's an experience, you connect with friends and family, you share, create, sh do everything you can do. It's, it's an amazing experience, it's highly empowering. It drives value in your life, but if you start to use it too much and become hyper-connected and spend too much time on it, it starts to impede your progress in life. Just like our mother said, you know, too much of anything is not good for you. Too much Facebook is not good for you. And Facebook's model is built on keeping your attention keeping your eyeballs, it's a pleasure trap, keeping you in so that they can deliver advertising because that's how they make their money. But Facebook will survive because it's not about Facebook, it's about you. You're the product and how can they help you live happier lives? How can they bring us closer together so that we get the value that we need to live our lives? I'm gonna go a little bit quicker over this model now because we're running out of time and there's a couple of other things I wanna talk to you about. Any questions here? So before I move on, there's a bargain here. The platforms are responsible for the security. Who's been reading the Equifax story? So this is one in two Americans have lost their identity now, their credit cards, their social security number, their address have been stolen and all linked together. Credit card fraud has been the highest in history last month. The CEO just resigned yesterday. It's a big issue. So there's a huge issue now in the US. You're gonna start reading it in the news now. It started only the last couple of weeks. But on the other side, privacy, that's up to the consumer. What we give to the system, all those little I agree buttons, and we have no idea what happens on the other end, that's our responsibility. And that's what the GDPR is trying to solve. But are is these companies go not going too far with it? Absolutely, it's the wild, wild west. But then you've got happiness, and it's normal because in my opinion, about a few years, the internet is caring for less happiness people. Absolutely. Because and that's why we disconnect sometimes. And that's why we stop using some of these apps. That's why London and Italy kick Uber out. Because as much as, uh, as, much as they're doing that's good, you know, empowering drivers to, to have employment, they're the biggest employer in the US. You know, empowering people to get from A to B, you have to make all the stakeholders happy. And the government is also responsible for keeping a healthy community running. And if Airbnb neglects that stakeholder, then that's a problem they have to face. So it's not just happiness for the consumer, it's happiness for all of the stakeholders involved. But is the online marketing not thinking to 
far, if you know what I mean. Like that uh, the prices of, of the people are going less and less. But isn't, are we not thinking too much to innovate? So remember the exponential curve? So all these companies are taking in incredible advantage of this era now with data and technology. And for us as consumers, we adopt these things, but in the end we ask ourselves, why do we have all this stuff? You know, do I need all this shit? And in the end, it's up to us. If we start to say, hey, I don't need this, then we, we stop. You see, one thing you need to understand, advertising is about getting people's attention. Marketing is about turning needs into wants. We, as marketers, turn needs into wants. And for that, we tell stories. And now we tell that in a fragmented environment called the internet, where people are all over the place and impatient. So you think that in the future we need to think easier instead of we have to think more innovative, more difficult? What do you mean by that? Data from people. Like the privacy of people is getting less and less. If you search on Google, like, um, like for example, how to make a bomb, you get following by the, by the law, by the, uh, how do you say it, by the government. Isn't that going too far, for example? For whom? For the one who searches. Because everything you do on the internet is followed. It's followed. It's yeah, so, what, so if it's for the consumer, what do you end up doing? Yeah, you quit. So that's not good for the internet or the online market. Who cares? It's about you, right? You said it's about you. Yeah. It's about your own privacy. So you start to disconnect. And you start to find ways of using this stuff in meaningful ways. If it's scary to you, then you start to disconnect. But if that happens to a whole population, what happens to the governments that have to get elected? They start to tell the story that people believe in. They start to tell, hey, this thing's really scary. We've got cyber warfare and cyber security coming. There are companies really disrupting our, our culture. And, and you start to believe in that and you start to vote for the people that are going to change what you want to see changed. It's a huge topic and we can, we can debate this for, for a ton, but in the end, it's, it's about you. It's about your behavior. It's about what you choose to do with this thing. And, and it's not just you, it's individually for every single person. So if the system is sustainable and if it's driving enough value and helping you live a happier, more productive, healthier life and you're okay with it then you will keep using it you will keep coming back to it but if you feel um, used abused mistrusted if you feel that then you will disconnect and the whole internet will disappear it's it's only 20 years old it's a baby it can still go but the thing is what we're seeing now it's growing but is it growing for the right reasons okay I, i'm getting philosophical now <laughs> It's some things to think about. This is pretty advanced stuff, but you guys are all really smart, so I'm sure you're, you're get, well, taking it in. I was wondering about GDPR. Yeah. It's a, I mean, I'm not convinced that it will uh, follow through because so much and so many companies is, uh, can you say, in charge of where GDPR wants to bring back uh, yeah. and prevent yeah. interruption, so, et cetera. So it's I'm, not I'm not convinced it will so the first thing, there's a, yeah, this is a huge debate. The, the one thing is you've got to realize GDPR has been around for a long time. Yeah. It's just that it wasn't defined granularly enough. So user privacy, what does that mean? You know, it was basically, you know, you, you use uh, the user's data in, in, in responsible ways, basically. But what, what does responsible mean? You know, so basically GD, the next version of GDPR is just defining all of the fine points, making sure that we understand what security, what privacy means, what does consent really mean? And, um, and, then, and, and that's going to pose constraints on advertisers and marketers. It's going to pose constraints on what companies can do. And up until now, it's been, yeah, I can do anything. Who cares? I'm not going to get fined. Nobody's going to know. So let's just go ahead with it, you know. Marketers exploit wants for profit. Let's just go. Let's just uh, make people want stuff and let's just exploit that and grow our companies. And in the end, you start to think, but what's happening with my data and who's actually monitoring all of this and what does people you know is the government even on this and it becomes a concern and this is what it's all about it's about bringing the confidence back into the into society that the internet is something that's here to stay and it's a good thing and and for that you need some regulation and on the one hand that regulation is going to be good because it's going to make it more sustainable um, 
it's going to help com traditional companies also have a chance of survival. Um, but on the other hand, it might you know, impede innovation a little bit because some of these new gadgets and tools that we don't really need anyway um, and that are all coming on and, and if they catch on, that they, they really disrupt things. Um, it's going to help slow that down so that we have a more sustainable growth because we can't keep going exponential. Eventually, we're going to be on a vertical curve and we're all going to shut down. We're all going to say no, which is sort of what... Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's personal for everybody, but it's a huge debate and we can go on for this for ages and we probably need to do it in a constructive way because it's actually quite a complex debate as well. There's so many different angles and so many different viewpoints. I can't, uh, we're running out of time, so let's see. How much time do we have? Two or three minutes. Um, there's an Amazon Go video. I'd recommend go and watch it yourself. I can, I can share this deck if that's useful. Uh, go and watch it. Amazon, that's how they're basically connecting the dots. Uh, the Awesomeness Pyramid is a pyramid that really stands core to what I believe in, but also what, what the future of a marketeer is. It's about a market. See, a marketer is, trying, is someone that's trying to influence others. You're either trying to influence a consumer to do stuff, or you're trying to influence somebody to get your idea propagated, get your campaign or if you say we need to use snapchat someone else has to decide yes i believe you snapchat is the place where we need to advertise it is the place where we need to tell stories so we it's about influencing others right and in order to do that you need people's respect and you need people's trust you, people need to respect you and you need trust so it's all about relationships in the end it's all about a healthy relationship so within the concept of that relationship you can influence under that is strategy it's about asking the right questions under that is process, it's about building plans on how to get there. Because you can tell someone, this is where we need to go, but if you don't tell them how to get there, nothing's gonna happen. Under that, it's operations. This is where you roll your sleeves up and you get the work done. This is where a lot of people start, is in the operational side, learning AdWords, learning display, learning social media. And that develops your expertise. It, it helps you gain respect with whoever you're having a relationship with, whether it be a client, for example. If you're a display expert, then the client's going to respect, at least give you the benefit of that, and then you're going to be able to grow that relationship. If the first campaign works out well, then you're going to gain some trust. And the next time, they're going to give you a little bit more autonomy, and slowly you're gonna, they're going to allow you to build the plans, and slowly they're going to allow you to get, become involved in the strategy of the campaigns, of the company, and slowly you're going to get into a more healthy relationship where you're going to have trust and respect, and, um, and also being likable is, is really important as well when you're trying to build relationships. Automation, so you've got to put technology into perspective. Technology is a tool that allows us to automate things and get more done with our time. It had ha the internet is a technology that allows us to connect at scale, build relationships at scale through a digital ecosystem. And we have now tools to do that, such as AdWords. And Google builds those tools, Facebook builds those tools, right? But they're ultimately, they're tools that automate processes, automate things, allow it to do more with our time so that we can spend our effort more up the top of this pyramid, building stronger relationships where we can have more influence. And so what we say is performance is a side effect of what we do. It's very important, but it's not what we focus on. We focus on this so that we do drive performance for every stakeholder involved. Here's a few pictures of media brands I took this morning. I thought it'd be nice to, to at least show you a little bit. This is our, our Hauskammer. It's where we're having our party tonight. We have got a pool table. There's five levels, but um, what it comes to is this is the entr entrance and this is all the different labels within media brands. Um, I, I work currently for Traffic For You. Auburn works for Super Digital, which is a new label we, we launched. But then we have different propositions. So June will be the next speaker. Robert, the founder of June, will come and speak to you in a couple of weeks on content. So June is a content marketing company. They create content and they market that content largely through social media. They have Netflix as a client. So maybe I'll tell him, can, we, can you show him, can you show the group a little bit about Netflix? But also they did some work on G-Star and, and different propositions. So he'll come talk to you about content. This is how to inspire people to pay attention. How to, how to actually tell stories to people that get them excited about your brand. Get people excited about Netflix. Get people excited about buying jeans at G-Star. Then we have um, Traffic For You coming in about customer journey. 
So you remember I told you this Internet of Things, this peppering of all these devices, we all have them in our pockets and on our rich watches, and we're looking at a screen now, and I've got another screen over here. These are devices that actually measure your behavior across a digital ecosystem. And measuring customer journey is really about understanding what is your journey through the, this ecosystem that ultimately, and how can we influence that journey, so ultimately you buy something from me, right? And that's and the last presentation will be then super digital. Auburn will now it will it be you presenting? Yeah. And he'll come back and talk to you about the last piece of it. Well, it's really the first piece. That's where you actually got them into the relationship. But the, the conversion side of it, so the engagement, so where the, the purchase moment. How do you actually trigger people over the top to make to give you money? Or to give you their time? Bring them into the business, and then you have a customer. And that's really where the relationship begins. Well, actually, who knows if there's a beginning and an end. But that's really where it, acceler it, it has the potential to accelerate. Because when you bring someone in and they have expressed interest and they, they're buying from you, then you're in a relationship. And then it's up to you. How am I going to service that relationship? How am I going to bring them in for a second time that's going to drive more value for them than for me? A whole different topic. But Okay, so I think, uh, and then we have different propositions. So just, just as an interest, we have initiative and UM. These are the relationship builders. These are the creative people, the strategy builders. They have a lot of trust, a lot of respect with our clients, and they are able to influence at a CMO level. This is how you need to spend your money right now. That's what it comes down to. We have Be Genius, which is a technology label. It allows you to build relationships and scale through technology. It connects to Google, it connects to uh, Microsoft and all these different platforms, you know, Marktplatz, uh, and, and, and the list goes on. Um, Magna, that's all about contracts. It's all about actually bringing in volume so you get more attractive prices. So with an ATL or all these big TV companies. Um, what's another interesting one? Uh, rapport is all about outdoor advertising, so that's billboards, which are becoming more and more digital now, and also sometimes more and more annoying because they take your attention away from the road when the, all these flashy things happen on a billboard, which could, it's controversial as well, but it allows you to programmatically buy things that people at that moment might be interested in. You know, it's nearing six o'clock, there's a McDonald's three kilometers down the road, is it not worth asking people if they'd like half price on their Big Macs or something like that, and then having them pull over. So influencing people's behavior through outdoor advertising. So the future belongs to those who hear it coming, but it's, built, it's, it's owned briefly by those who build it. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, there uh, okay. Uh, if there are any questions, so please do. We can have uh, Who's going to be more powerful <coughs> in the near future, uh, the government or uh, Google or Facebook and the big companies, the social media companies? What do you think? Mm, depends how you define power. Who has the power ultimately? Um, companies, well, yes, now at the moment we see the government as the, the, the ones who say we can and we cannot do this. But these companies now are defining their own rules <coughs> because we accept it because we have a little uh, pop up says, uh, do you agree? Yes, I agree. <coughs> So, what's the so why, why is that the way you see it, and why is that the way you accept it? <coughs> why? Yeah. Because we want to use. Why, why do you think that way? Uh, because you've been told that that's actually the case? Maybe. And is that true? Or is it false? Yes. Who ultimately decides if it's true or false? So who has the power? Me. Ultimately, the consumer has the power to elect the parties that actually ultimately 
bring in the regulators that are going to make the rules. So it's a democracy. And in some countries like China and Russia, which is much less of a democracy, you know, it's, there it is, the government that controls the population and they actually set the rules and the people don't have any control over what's being said or done. But in Holland, we have a lot of control as a population. We can choose who we want to govern us based on what change they're going to make for us. And if most people think one way, then ultimately the representative government of what, the, but that, that's politics. In the end, so you're, you're back to your question. So who is in control? Again, it, de it depends what you mean by control. And you need to understand that everything works out over time. So you need to define a, a time frame because if, if the time isn't defined, then, then so many things can happen. So who will have control over the next, in 2018, for example, when it comes to the use of data? Well, I think right now companies really have control over data, not the consumer. You accept, you give your data, you have no idea what's going to happen with it. And they're basically, it's a, it's a free range, it's, it's a wild west. They can pretty well do whatever they want with it. And that's how you get these oligopolies, the Googles, the Facebooks that just grow out of proportion. One of the big disruptors is going to be Amazon in the near future. They have a lot of data. They haven't really leveraged it in, in the ways that Google and, and Amazon have. What they've done is leveraged it in giving up, recommending products for us, getting us coming back. Um, who has control? I think in 2018, the government is trying to gain control, but you've got to realize we're in an era now where control is elusive because the consumer is ultimately empowered with your mobile phone, with the internet. So the government might want control, but in order to temporarily hold that control, they're going to have to regulate. But ultimately, if you're not happy with that regulation, they're going to be out too. So it depends. What's the time frame? How do you define control? Again, a huge topic of debate. I hope I answered enough of your question. <laughs> Any another question? So, it's, so I, I can't go into all the details of what GDPR is or isn't, but you know, if you wanted something and I told you you couldn't have it, what would you do? Try to get it. Yeah, you'd resist, huh? You'd resist. And it's what ultimately what it comes down to. Companies now have access to data in wonderful and weird ways where they can do all these wonderful things with it. And the government's saying, hey, you can only have access to this data if you use it in, in, within the, the context of the rules we're going to impose on you. And so, of course, they're going to resist. Of course, they're going to say, no, this is absurd. And, and of course, they're going to resist. But meanwhile, companies that aren't exploiting the system and haven't a little bit behind and haven't really got into all this digital stuff yet are going to say, oh, great. It at least slows down my competition. So it gives me breathing room to move forward. So you've always got these different sides. There's some people that are going to welcome it. Some people are going to resist it. Probably the people that are, are doing really well on the current system are going to resist the next one. Um, I think it's just all, it's just all, it's evolution. It, it's, it's a needed, it's a needed, it's needed. I don't need to say much more. It's needed because it's, um, it's something that's going to help us grow a more sustainable web. And if we keep letting it grow the way it is, then ultimately 
we're seeing it now, it starts to break down. And we, we haven't even started to see all the side effects, you know, from ad blockers of the consumer, but we've got cyber security and cyber warfare to worry about. And it's gonna take an atomic a Hiroshima or an atomic bomb to explode before the government starts to realize, oh geez, what is this? And, and, you know, you know, and it's happening in the US, you know, cyber attacks are huge. I mean, what happens when the internet goes down? All the trading systems go down. It's martial law again. It's, 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 it's um, walking dead, you know, if you watch Netflix. It all breaks down if the internet collapses because we've built all of our infrastructure on top of it. Yet it's all patched up. It's not working very well. It's just, it's, it's completely, it's, it's decentralized. But it's, so, and then we've got the blockchain coming. You know, we've got these Bitcoins. So this is a completely decentralized, but more distributed network, not even decentralized. So the internet is decentralized and it's running on, on a few core root areas. But then you've got the blockchain coming, which is distributed. That's where everyone's involved. You can't take it down, but who controls that system? Well, everybody really, but no one. And the GDPR is built on, well, someone needs to be accountable for the data. But when, in a blockchain environment, nobody's responsible and everybody's responsible. How, so it, there's still a lot, of, a lot of things to work out. And I think that what we need to do is just work through them. And, and that's where all the opportunity is. Because when everyone's confused and you see opportunity, then it's just flourish. If you can get the right methodology, the right, put the right ingredients in place, then you build something that others want. So it's, it's gonna be really interesting times, but the harder it gets, the better it gets. Think different. Also, just on that, because I brought back this slide, if you want to predict the future in some way, just look at this. In the future, ultimately, the consumer is going to have control over their data. And the, the companies are going to be responsible and are going to be held accountable for the security of the data that they hold over people. That's one of the trends you could almost bet your money on that, that that's going to keep growing. So whatever regulation, whatever decisions we're making or policymakers are making, it's going in that direction. It's companies are responsible for the security. Think of all these cloud platforms, Amazon, Microsoft, they're responsible for the security of the data, for the security of the infrastructure. On the other end, our behavior, which is now manifested in the form of data, will slowly but surely come into our control, or at least the perception of control which is a completely different issue. And then it comes down to who do I trust? Who do I trust? That's what it ultimately comes down to. If I'm gonna give my identity to this thing, who do I trust? And meaningful connections, it's a compass. It means the more you give to the system, the more you get back. So if you don't trust anybody and you don't give anything to you, you don't go and do your Google search because you don't know what, who's looking at that search, you stop using it, then Google's not gonna help you anymore you're gonna come out of the relationship. And that's what's gonna kill Google because it's not sustainable. They're not helping you live a happier life, right? So this is a compass that helps you navigate this system. And, and, and this is how to, to build relationships, make it sustainable, and the, the black and white of the equation, the, the data we give to the system and how much we trust that system to use that data in a way that ultimately helps us live better lives. Complex, but it's philosophical stuff. Final question? Oh. Yeah. Just one more thing. Uh, you talked about um, the choice of houses and stuff like that. What other groups would you recommend? Um, uh, I read about, uh, last year I did a book a day. So this year I'm doing about three or four a week. I listen, I don't read because I can't read. Um, I'm completely dyslectic, so I can't read. But plus, when I read, it's, it wastes my time because I can't do anything else. So I like listening. Um, All Marketers Are Liars. It's another book from Seth Godin. It's a good one. Um, another one from Seth Godin is uh, The Lynchpin. So it's something that you could read that's sort of how to be like really super cool, you know. <laughs> And otherwise, there's heaps of books. I mean, it depends what you want to know. If it's technology, then there's a whole heap of books uh, on, on, you know, the, the next digital revolution. Um, you know, contact me via LinkedIn or via Twitter. Uh, 
if you want, tell me what you want to know. And I've got, you know, uh, about 200 books behind me now. And they're all Audible, so I can all share them for free. So you don't have to pay for them. Because that's what Audible does. It allows you to share books with others at no cost. And that's the exponential nature of Audible. That's why Amazon bought them. And when we listen to things, we can do other things. That's another thing. Audio is hugely on the increase because you can go to the gym, you can drive while you're consuming content. But All Marketers Are Liars is a good second book. Well, thank you so, so, so much. Um, well, give one more uh, applause, please. <laughs> I don't know if it's to uh, say thank you with, or maybe you can buy something digital. Uh, oh, no, no, no. The more we get digital, the more non-digital becomes a luxury. So I'm very much non-digital whenever yeah, I can. buy socks or uh, Absolutely, yeah. Thanks. And something to... Um, cool, thanks. Great. Well, for the party tonight, we can yeah. drink it. <laughs> Thanks. And if anyone, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. But I've also opened, I know no one's on Twitter, but Instagram isn't the best place to have a conversation amongst the group. But there's a Twitter um, hashtag called Javier DM for digital marketing. And I'll, I'll check it, but just um, at me if you want to bring me into the conversation, just ask a question, you know, what book should I read or whatever, and I'll, I'll engage with you on Twitter. And maybe we can have a conversation and, you know, you can access me through any of the digital channels now. And that's a big luxury, I can tell you. So, so um, use it wisely.